Hello, I'm the Weird Christian, Doug Ferguson, and I'm doing a talk on, uh, going to be talking about the Westminster Confession, but before I get on that talk, I have to do a lot of several other talks on uh, why I'm doing this, um, which I'm, I, go be, I will be doing a criticism of the Westminster Confession, but I have to do several preliminary things first. Like why to say why I'm doing that? I have to talk about what is truth because people don't know what truth is, and I talked about what the gospel is, and um, the conflicting conflicts of authority that Christians have. You know, there's different there's Christians that have different understandings of what authority and law are, and who God is. So I talked a little bit about that. And um, right now I'm going to be doing a talk about uh, what happened in the Garden of Eden. Because uh, I'm not going to use the normal Aust Aust Augustine uh, understanding of what happened in the Garden. Uh, I don't think he really understood what original sin was. So, but uh, that is the what people use uh, nowadays is the understanding of original sin is what Augustine's thoughts are. And uh, I don't think he really understood the Bible. But anyway, that's... Uh, I'm, anyway, here we are. We're going to talk about what happened in the garden. What is stated currently in Christian circles is that man disobeyed God. Therefore, he failed to do the law. They assume doing the law was the first covenant. <clears throat> they present the idea that the covenant of law is an authoritarian making arbitrary rules and then doing a, uh, I caught you when the rule is broken. Then they assume that justice of God has this crazy retribution. All out of context, not understanding how God is restores. Instead, torturous punishment is the method for dealing with trivial breaking of arbitrary rules. They consider the tree of knowledge of good and evil is a test for Adam. He will go and will he go and touch the untouchable. What is actually wrong with Adam knowing the difference between right and wrong? So, they assume that just breaking this arbitrary rule of touching this tree to find out what right and wrong is about is a calamity. Not following the rules of the tyrant, without question, to be his robot is the real test. God is the master programmer, and to not follow the program is the sin he cannot stand. It makes him so angry. Because of this, Adam not following the rules, he is a broken piece in creation, and all his descendants are broken machines. Breaking the rules demands torturous eternal punishment in hell. These Gnostic theologians, Demiurge, is the god of fear and loathing. Why is the punishment eternal? They say, do you not know humanity has an eternal soul? Death does not truly stop the existence of a person. They cannot die. Is that not what the Bible says? Can you find that idea that man have an eternal soul anywhere in the Bible? I have not found it. Instead, I understand it as a made-up Gnostic doctrine preached by the schemer from the beginning. 
Maybe you think I am misrepresenting the Christian doctrine taught. I realize I'm not tickling any ears. But I'm asking you to question, search, think, and pray to God. Do these things and discover if you believe the truth or a lie. Am I presenting their case correctly? I have heard this story told in seminaries for centuries, and I find it beyond belief. It is an infantile interpretation of Scripture. Yet this has been the narrative conceived and believed for hundreds or maybe even 1,800 years. How could this understanding pass the mustard for so long? Is there no one who searched? Does no one question? Can no one think? Does no one know how to read? Has God's Spirit not been listened to? Has it not occurred to anyone that the issue in the Bible is, what kingdom do you want to be in? That is the entire issue, the total point of the Bible. Yet no one sees that was the issue in the garden. Is all mankind blind? It is not about a tyrant God making arbitrary rules to be traps so a malicious law system can be used to terrorize the people into fearful, unthinking compliance. In the garden, God presented two types of governance and kingdoms. Adam was given a choice of living in the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of God. That's interesting. There we go. Adam could make up his own kingdom of, by thinking of himself as the arbitrator of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam could make, him, Adam could make himself a kingdom based on a system that the serpent, serpent presented. He could worship Satan. This is the same thing presented to Jesus Christ in the wilderness. Adam, at the time of his sin, was presenting the hidden Gnostic knowledge to the people. You ask, what people? Was not Adam the first person? Not according to the Bible. But everyone glosses over the obvious reading of Scripture. I cannot understand how everyone can be so blind. Has no one ever asked a question? Does no one know how to read? Let me state the obvious reading of Scripture. Chapter 1 is the general creation of all things. And you can see it here, general creation of all things. Chapter 2 is the creation of the garden the special holy temple place to converse with God and with God, the Garden of Eden. In Hebrew, the word translated for mankind and the person Adam has the same root. And it's only the context and an extra letter possibly that gives the ability to translate the sentence to give it meaning in our language. Also, the word for used for earth has the same root used for the entire earth, the known earth, or just a small location or plot. It is the context and possibly an extra letter added to the word to give its meaning in the sentence. In context of the general creation, the word for God 
in Hebrew is Elohim. This is the plural word for God. For gods, actually. So, but because this noun is used with a singular verb, it is translated as God. El is a singular form of God in Hebrew, which uses the Hebrew letters Aleph and Lamed. The letters mean strong shepherd. I wonder if I got that here. Like, Shep uh, like uh, David was a strong shepherd, killing Goliath with a shepherd's weapon, the sling. So, in the sentence of Genesis, God is described as the plural one, which is at least two, but could be translated in a Christian Bible as Trinity. Just a thought. The word used to describe the one in relationships between man and woman is the word ahad. It is also the word used to describe the relationship between the persons of Yahweh. No Israel, the Lord your God is ahad. This is the same word used for a cluster of grapes and in other similar uses of one. A nation ought to be ahad in spirit, hope, vision, mission, and promise. Diversity of these things can create animosity between the people in a nation and a breakdown of national institutions and courts and governance. In the creation of Adam and Eve in the garden, the Hebrew word for God used is Yahweh Elohim. The letters in Yahweh mean the hand reveals, the nail reveals, the upright man. This is the name God uses when dealing with people directly. It can be clued, concluded that the unique creation of Eden is within the general creation. So the general creation deals with the entire earth, while the second narrative deals with only an area of the earth where Eden is. This, it, yet, is this taught? No. It is taught that it is the same creation, yet the order of things is different. I am not the only one with the under, this understanding of general and temple creation. Professor Michael Heisert, Heiser, a Hebrew scholar, also concluded that the secondary creation story is about a temple garden, and I am sure there must be others. God makes things obvious but no one sees them. Another obvious plant pattern in Genesis is the priesthood coming out of the nations. This happens in Abraham's calling. For every patriarch from Adam to Noah, it is their mission to call the people out of the worldly nations and into the kingdom of God. The same pattern is, is, is in the creation narratives. First, there is a general creation of people, and then there is a unique priesthood of Adam in the Eden creation. This is the plain order presented in the Bible. Yet, who in these days sees this? The conclusion from the pattern used in Genesis is that Adam is not the first man created by God. Adam is the first priest created by God to tell mankind who God is. Therefore, mankind in the world was abundant and a priest was needed to teach the populace. God created Adam for this task of teaching. Instead, Adam used the office God gave him 
to establish his own kingdom, a kingdom based on the way Satan governs. Essentially, Adam was attempting to replace God. Adam was an anti-God. We use the term antichrist in Christianity because Christ is God. He was taking the place of Christ. Though through Adam's, Adam's leadership, all have fallen into Satan's kingdoms. Adam, in his confession, blamed woman and God for his attempt to usurp God. Yet God gave him mercy and told Adam the promise of restoration and resurrection, giving the sacrificial animal to cover his bloody sin against God. These two kingdoms have two different ways of governance. One kingdom is based on a reality of lies. The other is based on truth. One is the kingdom of this world. The other is the kingdom of promise. This is the dichotomy of the two trees in the garden. The garden scenario is not Adam breaking the law. It is Instead, it is Adam creating his own laws and kingdom. The same kingdom Satan offered to Jesus in the wilderness. Adam chose the kingdoms of this world. The easy kingdom of the office is the authority. Might is right. Might is right. <laughs> they have lots of that in Marvel. Eh? Adam was had a garden of everything and took it for granted. Jesus was in the wilderness with nothing, but was committed to his mission of being the saving, suffering servant who gives the vision and offers the way to God's kingdom of promise. Yet man have distorted the issue so they can hide from God. They turn the God of the Old Testament into the Demiurge. An angry God who has observed rules and, it is, and a distorted sense of justice. A God who is out of touch with what is going on in people's lives or how to transform people. The Gnostics have their transcendent God of fate. Who is above the Demiurge, this God of fate will deliver them the enlightened chosen from this sinful, fleshly, material world to the ethereal, spiritual world divorced of reality. This is their fantasy. This is not the current Gnostic Christian gospel. The current Gnostics emerged, the regular Gnostics, understanding of different gods into one god that has justice and manners which seem chaotic and crazy. They gloss over this insane God who they believe in with st the statements such as, His understanding is above ours, or to His glory and infinite wisdom. And who are you, you unenlightened, damned to hell person, to question this almighty God? There'll be more on this Gnostic Christianity later in the when I talk about it in the, in the next video, well, not next video, I'm going to talk about Gnosticism in the next video, but uh, in this video soon, I'll be talking about Gnostic Christianity, which is not Christianity at all, but a heresy. And here's the new age of immortal men. <laughs> anyway, not only this, but they tell people, you are immortal. They use the phrase, the breath of God as a claim to God giving divinity to Adam. In Hebrew, in Genesis, the same breath is used for animals in creation. Are they divine? Is the divinity in all things created by the breath and word of God? Are we immortals to lose our identity in the universe of pantheism?
Yet the Bible claims that there is only only God is eternal. But with this other understanding of God, we become confused and lost. Not understanding the term made in God's image, believing the claim to that makes people chosen divine ones, able to lord it over the damned unenlightened. These people proclaim themselves as diviners of truth. They puff themselves up and condemn others. Being Gnostics who believe that they have heavenly knowledge and this world of flesh is not them, so they justify the evil they do. I wonder if I got... Oh, yeah. yeah I do. But to those eating from the tree of life, these followers of Yahweh depend on God for everything. They ask God to do things in their life, realizing their need, because they are finite. They rest in the Lord and wait for Him to lead, for they know that their heart will lead them astray. The one eating from the tree of knowledge believes God entitles them to do what their position allows. From the position of authority, they become the gatekeepers who establish the systems, system of acceptance and hierarchy of power, determining right and wrong, being self-deceived. They believe they are immortal with a divine nature, predestined to live forever. One can also see the parallels between what happened in the garden with what happened to Saul as he waited for Samuel before the battle. In Samuel 13, Saul attempted to usurp, usurp Samuel's priest role by doing the sacrifice instead of waiting. The sacrifice is done by one who is humble, knowing the dependence on God for forgiveness and trusting his promise. Saul failed to trust God in his promise. Instead, his courage left him, and he saw as he saw his army leave. And one can see the parallel to David when he sinned with Bathsheba. David used his position for his gratification and to hide his iniquity in murder. Only by admitting his sin and placing himself on the mercy of God was he restored. Yet the pain of his sin continued through his kingdom and the promise was only restored through Christ. In truth, an examination of Adam's sin and many sins recorded in the Bible reveals the archetype sin pattern repeated. And through Adam confessed, and though Adam confessed his sin, yet he blamed God. And the consequences of sin continue. There is an archetype for sin, and there is an archetype for grace to salvation. For in Adam, we all follow the same pattern of sin and death, but in Christ, we realize our need. Ask him in our struggles and wait and follow the way of life, believing in his promise. The question for every individual is, what kingdom do we wish to be in? The kingdoms of this world or the kingdom of promise. If we wish to be in the kingdom of promise, we need to know the way to transfer our citizenship into that kingdom. Christ states we must believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth, asking for forgiveness and transformation. I desire to be a citizen of his kingdom where people love God and others. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. With these premises set, the correlation between Adam's sin and the self-righteous actions of Calvin 
and those who wrote the Westminster Confession becomes apparent. But there is still more to know before beginning the actual criticism of the Westminster Confession. Now, I just told you a bunch of stuff that <laughs> the Gnostics will say is heresy. But I dare you to find where in the Bible it says that the man is immortal. And I dare you to find in the Bible where it says that God, Jesus, took God's wrath. Jesus saved us from God's wrath. And he transforms us by his power and spirit and word. But it does not say that Jesus took God's wrath. Jesus took our iniquities upon him. Your sins and mine. That the, the way we sin against one another is a personal sin against God. If you read Matthew 25, you will see that um, personal sin against other people is a personal sin against God. And those are the types of sins that put Christ on the cross. People lie to him. We lie to other people. People betray. People stab people in the back. They um, misrepresent. They steal from each other. They hate other, each other. These are all the sins that put Christ on the cross. Our sins. You have to say, yes, my personal sins against other people put Christ on the cross. And you can see the bloodiness of that sin, your sins on the cross. You don't blame other people. It's not a corporate forgiveness. It's a personal forgiveness for each individual. It's available to the whole world, but it's individuals. It's done individuals by individuals, not corporately. Anyway, um, I'm going to be, my next talk will be on Gnosticism. Um, this one is a big one to chew on that I just did what happened in the garden because it's a total different understanding than the Augustine thought about what original sin is. The guy didn't know. He was a Manichaean, which was a Gnostic. Anyway, and there's been Gnosticism since Adam. Okay? No, that's something nobody teaches. I know. But open your eyes, read, ask questions, search, and pray to God, and he will give you knowledge. Anyway, God bless you. May God's peace be on you. And um, I, I don't know if anybody will listen to my talks, but uh, if you do, give me a comment or something. And uh, um, straighten me. Straighten me out if you can. I don't know. Do whatever you want. But um, may God be with you. Thank you. Amen.